grab your Bibles if you have them with you and go with me to the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. We have been in this series on an Elijah generation. Uh, we started that on last week and I want to pick that up and continue in part two this morning just to share some more. We're going to be here and take a little break for the Easter season, but we're going to allow God just to move and be God in our midst. I mean, let's pray and then we're going to walk through the word of the Lord and allow God just to move and have his way in our midst. Holy Spirit, you're an awesome God. Holy Spirit, we thank you for you. We lift your name on high, God. Everything that was said today was so relevant from the call to worship, to the song, to the prayer, to the welcome, that we're not ignorant of what was going on in our culture. We're going to take it seriously, Lord, but at the same time, we recognize that you are God, so we choose the big God, not the little gods of this world. So as we go to your word this morning, open our hearts to hear more, to be in tune, to adjust, and most of all, God, to be wise stewards, God, obeying the law of the lands, its social distancing, and the necessary quarantines and all the stuff that has to happen, God, to obey the stay-at-home order. But we just trust you for healing. We trust you for miraculous. We trust you for what you're doing. So as we open the pages of Scripture to teach, Felix dies, and I invite you to take residence on the throne of my life. Speak through me to your people as we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Today I'll be dealing with um, the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, just the first seven verses. We'll be sharing about that. But for those of you that may have missed last week, I just want to review just uh, one, the, the introduction of last week, because it's a great setup for what we're going to be talking today about this text. And if you were to back up to um, chapter 16, verse 33, let me just read one verse, then we'll talk about this and then jump into our text for today. Here's what verse 33 says. And Ahab made an Asherah, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord our God of Israel to anger than, than did all the kings who were before him. As you look at this text, we begin the process of studying this fellow by the name of Ahab, and we're talking about what he was doing. So if they can put that review slide on the screen, I want to talk through this real quick. Here's some things that you need to understand about Ahab, right? He was the most wicked king at that particular time that existed, right? So he was accused of three unthinkable sins. Here's what he did, and you're going to hear more about this lady in the upcoming week. He was married to Jezebel, who was the daughter of Ethbaal. He was, secondly, duly aligned in his theocracy. What that means is that he wanted to worship Yahweh God, and then he wanted to worship Baal at the same time. Does anybody out there at home, anybody know you can't do that, right? You, you got to choose who you're going to serve, amen? You can't, you can't go down those paths with God. And then here's the interesting thing. He was duly aligned in his worship life because here's what that meant. He would have to go, because of Jezebel, go worship Baal. So he built this temple for Baal to worship Baal. He built an altar in the temple which signifies the fact that he had to go there and worship him. And then when the Israelites assembled for worship, he was prone because he was their king to have to worship him as well. So this guy was confused. He was double-minded in everything that he did. Matter of fact, if you read the, the remain of that passage in chapter 16, his leadership even was influential to people who was in his kingdom. Because you see, where the word of God was issued, that once Jericho was tore down, it ought not be rebuilt. This king was so bold and so influential that he had people sacrificing their children to rebuild this kingdom. Now, here, here's the thing as we transition to what I want to share with you today. Does anybody know that when you are so defiant to what God is saying, that God's going to raise up an Elijah? The phrase I've been using was an Elijah generation. He's going to raise up an Elijah that will be unafraid to go to the Ahabs of this world and declare, thus saith the Lord. So we get to chapter 17, and Elijah comes on the scene, and in verses 1 through 7 of chapter 17, Elijah has a threefold instruction that he ought to commit or command or give to this king. And, 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 and I want to share three things with you from this text this morning, very briefly, to be sensitive to where you are. I just want to share three things for us to, to take away from the text, and that is I want you to hear me say this morning that God has called the church, he's called the Elijah generation 
generation of this day and age, number one, to make a proclamation to the Ahabs. And here's the second thing. Once you make that proclamation, God is big enough that he's going to protect you. <laughs> you got to hear me say that. He's going to protect you from the kings of this world. And then in the protection, thirdly, there's also provision where he's going to provide to make sure you're taken care of. So here's the first thing. Let's look at this text. And I want you to hear me say, number one, as you put the first slide on the screen, that God uses the Elijah generation to proclaim his word to the Ahabs of this world. So look with me at chapter 17, verse 1. Let me just read that, and then we'll talk about it. Now it says here, Now Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, listen to this, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these uh, these years except at my word. Let me read that one more time. Elijah the Tishbite of uh, Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except at my word. Now, church, here's what you need to understand. God had prepared Elijah for such a time as this. And the season was right and the timing was right where God now calls Elijah, whose name means Yahweh or Jehovah is my God. Elijah was clear on who he served and who God was. And so God called him and God raises him to go to the Ahabs of this world and declare what God was going to do because of what was happening in the text. Now, here's what you need to understand about the text that's in front of us. And if you missed last week's session, make sure you go to the RCF network and listen to that. The tension that existed at the time of the text was that Jezebel was working through her husband Ahab to make Baalism. And what Baalism is, it's the worship of Baal. It's the God that the Phoenicians, that's the Ugaritic or the Canaanite people, worship. And what Ahab and Jezebel was trying to do, the Israelites had Jehovah Elohim, who they worship, and the Canaanites had the God that they worship. And what Ahab and Jezebel was trying to do was trying to convince the rest of the world that there was no difference between their God and Jehovah God. And so they wanted to give people an option. They wanted to say to him, I hear what your God can do, but we serve a God. And and, and we all know because we have the entire story that their God was not the true and living God. And they wanted to pair them side by side to say who was what and that Baal was no different than who God was. So God raises up Elijah and said, I need you to go make a proclamation. I need you to go to the king. Now, I don't know about you and the text doesn't give us much detail about this, but I could understand that that conversation with Ahab and Elijah went something like this. Elijah left where he was and he made his way, and and we don't know if he met Ahab in the palace or if he met him out in the country where he met him, but but my imagination kind of leads me to believe like this, that Elijah was bold enough to go to Ahab and say to him, Ahab, I realize that you serve Baal and you serve God at the same time. But God has sent me to make a declaration that there comes a time when we need to make a choice between who we're going to serve. And and I know, Ahab, that you and Jezebel and all the Phoenician peoples believe this fact that that Baal is the God of the dew and he's the God of the rain and he's the God of the storm. In other words, I get the fact that you guys believe him to be the God of fertility. But I stand as a representative of the one true God. And here's what God is having me to say to you, Ahab. If you think Baal really is the God of fertility, if you think that Baal really is the God of the storm, if you think that Baal really is the one who provides for you, here's what Jehovah Elohim called me to tell you. He's going to stop the rain and he dare you to call on Baal 
to make it rain. <laughs> and then God even goes as far as to say, until he speaks again, the rain is not going to come. Matter of fact, I can imagine Elijah was quoting scriptures to Ahab, right? He probably said to him, Ahab, you should have read Leviticus and you should have read Deuteronomy because here's what those scriptures says. When the people of God turn away from God, God is going to withhold the rain. And, 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 and Elijah probably even said to Ahab, Ahab, you should have read the script because in, in 2 Chronicles, Chronicles 7 13 here's what it says when I shut up the heavens says the Lord so that there is no rain and I command the locusts and the land and, the, and I send pestilence among my people here's what verse 14 says if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways God says Ahab he's going to hear from heaven he's going to forgive their sin he's going to heal the land so God sent me, Ahab, to say to you that God wants his people to turn. <laughs> I wish I had. I wish I had somebody in here that, that God has come to reveal. Now, 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 I know you all are at home. I know you're in your bedrooms. I know you're, you're listening wherever you, but, but I want you to lock into this, that if I really understand the principle of what this text is committing, uh, communicating today, and, and, and the drought that Ahab prophesied was caused because of what Ahab was doing in the land, because of what was going on, and, and and when I evaluate what's happening with this coronavirus and I evaluate what's happening with the, praise, the, the plague and this pandemic that we're facing today, I just wonder, I just wonder, could God be doing the same thing? Now that he did in that, I, I just wonder, I, I just wonder, has the people of God so turned to God? Have we been so caught up in our own Baal worship and we're trying to compare the things of the world with the things of God that God is saying, I'm going to withhold my hand? I just wonder. I just wonder, could God be doing this? Because we all know that it, his, it is his prerogative to do what he wants done. So as I approach this text and I realize that God calls us to proclaim his word, I wonder what's really happening today. So, but, but here's the midst of all that. We need to know, number one, that the people of God are still called to be the Elijahs of this world, to go to the Ahabs of this world and say, to them, we ought to serve God, not Baal. Amen. And sometimes when the church stays silent, sometimes when the people of God say silent, God will cause proactive action and we need to speak for the Lord in these moments of difficulties. Now here's what you need to know as I move on to the second thing. I don't want to keep you long. The second thing is that when we get bold enough to proclaim thus said the Lord, hear me say this secondly, that God will protect the Elijah generation. Come on, put that second thing up there. He will protect us when we develop the boldness that we need to say, thus said the Lord. Look with me, look with me at verse 2. Look at verse 2 all the way to 5. And the word of the Lord came to him, that's Elijah, depart from here and turn eastward, and my translation says, and hide yourself by the brook Sherith, which is east of the Jordan, and you shall drink from the book, because I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he, being Elijah, went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. Now, Elijah just made this dramatic announcement. He developed this boldness to go to say to Ahab, thus said the Lord. And then notice the second series of events. He made this proclamation, and then divine protection comes on the scene. Come on, wherever you are, I don't need you to turn to your neighbor or even point to yourself and say, Self, God will protect me. Yet yeah, this divine protection came. God says to him, watch this, leave where you are and go to this brook and put yourself in hiding as my means of protection. Now, dare I be crazy enough to even say that God commanded Elijah to socially distance yourself <laughs> from Ahab and put yourself in quarantine 
because I've issued a stay-at-home order. I wish I had somebody here because I want you to put yourself in a place where Ahab and Elijah can't get to you. And sometimes I wonder if the protection of God doesn't look like that. Come on now. He, he will say to you, socially distant from yourself, from those who can harm you, put yourself in quarantine and obey my stay-at-home order after you've done what I said I've called you to. Because the reason I point that out is because we all know, we all know that Ahab and Elijah was on this rampage to try to find um, Elijah. Ahab and Jezebel was on this rampage to find Elijah because Elijah had just said, if you think Baal is all that, let him make it rain. And they were trying to kill him. And so God puts him in quarantine. People of God, world, let me say this to you. Don't take what's happening. I want y'all to hear me lightly because God could be doing something unique in this realm. Here, here is what I want you to know is that God has a way, secondly, of protecting the Elijah generation because of how God will use us. Understand with me that, that Elijah was bold enough to say, thus said the Lord. He was bold enough to say, this is what God is going to do. This is what God is going to do in the world. And church, I want you all to hear me say, if, if we are bold enough to stand up and say, thus said the Lord, understand with me that God is big enough the worship team just said he's so strong. He's so mighty. He is great enough to protect you such that no demon in hell can access you. I want y'all to hear me say this. I'm reminded of Job in this moment that when the devil said to the Lord that, I, that I've gone through the earth through and fro trying to find somebody to devour. Here's what God says. Have you considered my servants Job? And, 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 and then here's the, uh, the, the enemy's response. Well, God, you've got him <laughs> at a stay-at-home order. <laughs> You've got him quarantined. You've got him socially distancing himself. In other words, you've got a hedge of protection around him. And I want y'all to hear me say this, church. I want you to hear me say this, people. When you are bold enough to go to the Ahabs of this world, God will protect you. God will protect you. Come on, God will protect you. God will take care of you. God will make sure that no demon in hell can harm you. I'm reminded of the Israelites when they were in Egypt and God rained down those 10 plagues on Egypt. It was interesting to find that the Egyptians suffered the consequences, but the children of God were protected in Goshen. I'm trying to let you hear me say this morning that God's going to protect you. Even when they went in the wilderness wanderings for 40 years, still God protected them. I wish I had somebody in here that I could understand that God could protect you. Even even David, when Saul was trying to chase him, it is no accident that God had him in that cave of Adullam. God will protect you. And, and here's what I want y'all to hear me say this morning. Everyone that's a part of the Elijah generation, please understand that when we go to the Ahabs, you have the confidence and the assurance that God will protect you. Now, 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 lest we become spiritually arrogant. I need to put a parenthetic here. And I want y'all to put this on the screen. God's protection does not always mean exemption. I, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. God's protection does not always mean exemption. You see, God sent Elijah to Ahab to predict the drought, right? But it's also important to understand that Elijah suffered the same consequences of the drought that he predicted. Oh, I want y'all, I want y'all to hear. Observe with me. If food was scarce for Ahab, hear the text, food was also scarce for Elijah. Amen. Y'all get it. Y'all get it. Come on now. If, if food, if, if water was scarce for Ahab, here's this. Water was also scarce for Elijah. Come on. If, if the essential necessities of life was scarce for Ahab, those same essentials was also scarce for Elijah. The difference, though, that I need you all not miss, it's in who is providing for who. 
you got to get this. Because you see, with Ahab, and this is what the text is all about, his dependence was on Baal to provide for him. With Elijah, his provision came from God. And, and I don't know about you this morning, but if you serve the true God, you can go through the consequence of the proclamation. But if you know who your provider is... I wish I had somebody in here. If you know who your provider is, God will always protect and he takes care of you. So, so don't miss this. Protection doesn't always mean exemption. I know you might have missed what Pastor Derek was doing with a spray bottle in his hands, but don't make the mistake into thinking that because God's protecting you, you don't have to wash your hands. Come on. Don't make the mistake of thinking that because God is protecting you, you don't have to socially distance yourself. Don't make the mistake of thinking that because God is protecting you, you, you don't have to obey the laws of the land. Protection doesn't always mean exemption. And notice this. The reason God took Elijah and put him by the brook, because God had himself realized, I'm about to do something in the land. And if you don't obey me or what I'm saying to you, you too will suffer the consequences. Uh, come on, y'all. Talk to me. Talk to me. So, so lock into this. We make the proclamation, right? In the proclamation, there's protection. But here's the third thing I want to say to you, and then we're going to pray, is that in the proclamation, after there's protection, here's the thing. There is always provision. I wish I had a witness in here. Lock into what? Lock into what 1 King chapter 6 says, right? Notice what it says here. I mean, chapter 17, verse 6. Here's what it says, right? And the Lord brought, and the, and, and the ravens, the text says, brought him, being Elijah, bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And then the text says, and he drank from the brook. Let me read it again. Let me read it, read it, read it out because I like this. And, and, and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the book, the brook. Now, understand with me that Elijah's proclamation of the drought impacted him himself. And God had socially distanced him, and God had quarantined him, and God issued a stay-at-home order, meaning don't leave the brook. <laughs> I think some of y'all get what I'm talking about this morning. Are you hearing me? But even in that, even in Elijah's confinement, I find the text is critical, and it gives us some pointed details on how God provided for the Elijah generation. Notice what the text says. He used ravens. Now, what's striking about the raven is that if you were to read the book of Job, here's the raven. The raven is a type of bird that's so selfish, it will give birth to the young, but it does not even provide for the young itself. But yet and still, God miraculously will use this selfish bird to provide. Come on, I wish I had somebody here for a servant, right? And when you look at that word bird, uh, food, Pastor Derek, the, the, the word food doesn't necessarily mean steak and lobster. I need somebody in here. The word food doesn't necessarily, come on, mean baked chicken and fried catfish and hot water cornbread. Y'all not hearing me this morning. The word food doesn't mean that he can drive and leave his stay-at-home order and go to Chick-fil-A. Oh, Y'all not hearing me this morning. Th that word food simply meant, lock into this, that whatever the raven ate, a, I mean, Elijah had to eat. Ah, so if the raven was used to eating seeds and nuts and eggs, he would take the seeds and the nuts and the eggs and he would bring it to Elijah in his stay-at-home order and Elijah had to eat what the bird ate. Y'all not hearing me this morning because you think, we, 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 we think that protection means exemption. But I want to show you how God will provide you for you when we find ourselves in those places. So listen, don't confuse provision with with personal desires because here's what the scripture says yes God will give you the desires of our heart yes he will do this but listen to this when we are in quarantine God will use any means necessary to provide for his people here's the thing the choice is his 
it is not ours because he's providing. And the good news in what I'm saying to you, Baal can't provide even if he wanted to, but God, I wish I had somebody in here. He always provides. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure that Elijah wasn't used to eating bird food. Come on. But he was quarantined, and he realized that God was in control. And, and here's the word of the Lord for your process in church and people of God. Here's an encouragement. God will still provide for those who are a part of the Elijah generation. But here's the thing. You just got to resolve the fact that provision might not look like what you're used to. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah, you see, the amount of food you're used to eating may not be the same but you still got food. Come on. The amount of uh, shoes that you're used to buying or the type might not be the same, but you still have shoes. Come on. The amount of clothes that you're used to wearing may not look the same, but you still have clothes. I wish I had somebody in here in those position of quarantine when God has issued those stay-at-home orders to protect us from the Ahab and the Elijah and the Jezebel of this world. You need to hear me say that God's got you just don't try to put the demand on God to do for you what you're used to let him do what he wants to do oh you got to get that this morning you got to get that this morning I'm reminded of the Israelites for 40 years here they were in the wilderness yet God provided shoes didn't wear out they were socially distanced they were quarantined and they had to do what God has called them to do. So here's a parenthetic, people, and I'm done. Here's a parenthetic. Put that last slide on the screen. Be careful of getting comfortable with those places of provision as God will cause your brook to dry up to remind you who provider really is. Look at verse 7, then we're going to stop. After a while, my Bible says, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I look around, I see a pandemic. I see a coronavirus. And I think if it stay around long enough, our brooks, y'all get it, your brook just might dry up. You wonder why, you wonder why in this pandemic, even though you serve God, you went to work and your boss still said, hey, I got to let you go. Well, here's the thing. When the job becomes God, sometimes God will dry your brook up to show you who God is. Come on. You, 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 wonder, you wonder why when you figure I've socially distanced myself. I've done all this stuff to protect myself, yet and still, you know, in my provision, I'm still finding myself with symptoms. Here's the thing. When you have caused whatever it is to become God to you and your confidence is in the place of provision rather than God, God will cause your brook to dry up. I want y'all to hear me this morning. I want you to hear me because here's his reason. He wants us to choose God. Put that big idea on the screen. The big G, not the little God. And whenever we choose those small G gods, he has the prerogative to dry our brooks up because he's God. Here's what he says. You shall have no other God before me because I, the Lord, your God, I'm a jealous God. Here's how I want to set up next week. Your brook may have dried up. You may not know where provision is coming from anymore. I want to say to you, hold on. Help is on the way. There is a woman in Zeropath that God has prepared to help you. And we're going to talk about that next week. He won't leave you hanging. Come on, bow your heads with me wherever you find yourself. Holy Spirit, you're wonderful, God. You're awesome. You're gracious. We thank you for you, God. That you've called us, number one, to proclaim. And number two, in the proclamation, there is protection for the Elijah generation. And in the protection, there is provision. But here's my caution to those of us that are in protection, enjoying your provision. Don't let the provision become God to us. Because you will dry the book, look up. So God, if there's a person out here that's struggling, tell them, hold on, because help is on the way. They're going through what they're going through. Tell them, hold on, because help is on the way. If they find themselves in a difficult place, tell them, hold on, because help is on the way. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for this word. In your name, amen. 
Let me say this as we leave you. If you've been watching this worship experience and you want prayer, you want to give your heart to God, click one of the links on the bottom of this experience and we have people that will respond to you. Email us at our website. There's an information card that you can fill out to say, hey, I want to give my heart to Christ. I need prayer. I need someone to contact me. Make sure you do that and we will be sure to follow up with you. Here's connect with a small group, connect with someone for a deeper Bible study. We're going to be here Wednesday again talking about this text. I'm praying through it. We're going to do that with a panel or a group of us. I don't know. We're going to see. But we want to take this deeper because I think there's a relevance between what Ahab was going through and what God is doing. Join us Wednesday at 7 for that, to allow God to move and have his way. Now, if you've been worshiping with us and you're on the net RCF network, if you're on Facebook, even if you're on YouTube, wherever you are, switch over to the RCF network or follow the links on the bottom of whatever you're looking. And we want to encourage you to give this morning. This ministry is made possible. Us coming here is available to you because of your generosity and your gifts. Click one of those buttons or if it's text to give, grab your phone. Texting is real easy. Make sure you connect with us and support the ministry so we can be and continue to bring this word with you. If you are a member of Restoration Christian Fellowship, we're going to continually communicate with you to let you know we love you and we care. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for watching us. Um, tell your friends we're going to come on at 11 again. Tell them it's going to be here. Allow God to move and have his way. God bless you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Amen.